Hi, uh, my name is Chris Roth. I'm an Anglican priest in the Diocese of Calgary. Right now I'm living in Red Deer, serving St. Leonard's Anglican Church. And uh, I used to be in Edmonton, and that's where I got to know, know Tim. And um, he's, a, he's a good guy, so I'm happy to help him out. I should say that I'm not an expert in this, in any uh, way of thinking about this. But what I am is... Uh, uh, I'm, an, I'm someone who's interested in the topic, who has spent a bit of time reading and researching in this area. And so I find it fascinating. And I also came from a place where at different points in my life I was not a Christian, and sometimes I was quite hostile towards Christianity. And so these, this topic, big questions, these are questions that I genuinely wrestled with, and I did not always believe that Christianity had the best answer to these. Um, and um, I also had adopted different worldviews um, growing up. And so I, I uh, was not always a Christian. And so these, anyway, it's just a way of saying that this is something I'm interested in because it's something that I have wrestled with uh, for, for a while. And especially as I was becoming a Christian, these were important things, uh, important conversations to me. So what we're doing today is we're looking at big questions, how to address and explore some of the most common objections to the Christian faith. Sometimes this is called apologetics. And what is apologetics? Uh, we're not giving an apology, uh, but not in that usual sense of the word. What we're doing is we're dealing with misunderstandings and challenges to the Christian faith. So, First uh, Peter says, always be prepared to give an answer, and in the Greek, apologian, to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. That's First Peter 3, verse 15. So apologetics is to give an answer or to give a defense. So for example, in the ancient world, people sometimes t heard Christians talking about the Christ child. We make a big deal of the Christ child around Christmas. But there was also talk about communion, where we would consume Christ. And people would sometimes put those things together and think that Christians were maybe eating babies or there was some sort of cannibalism happening at Christian meetings. And so it was important for Christians to respond to that and say, no, 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 you're misunderstanding. This is not what, we, what we're what we doing. Uh, so this has been a part of Christian practice for a very long time, giving answers to these misunderstandings. Uh, likewise, similar misunderstandings happen when Christians were calling each other brother and sister. and They'd go to these meetings where not everyone was allowed because um, it wasn't as open back then. Uh, because sometimes it was dangerous, actually. And so they talk about each other as brothers and sisters, and there's also be this part of the worship service where there'd be this kiss of peace. And so you hear about these brothers and sisters kissing, and there'd be these rumors about Christian gatherings being kind of an incestuous orgy. And so it was important that Christians gave answers to these, to, um, to correct these misunderstandings about what was happening in Christian gatherings. So... Uh, apologetics is a very ancient practice. Um, Christians were trying to give an answer to what it is that we believe, the hope that is within us, correcting misunderstandings, but also showing why some of the criticisms aren't maybe as strong uh, or don't hold in the way that the people who gave those arguments maybe think they do. Uh, so what what do we do with apologetics? So we can encourage someone's interest in Christianity if they believe that there are no good reasons for being a Christian. Apologetics can help people see why there might be a good reason to believe in Christianity. Uh, it can defend the church. Uh, we believe in um, the, the Christ calls the church his, his bride. And so it is important that we, it, when appropriate, um, defend the church. It can encourage Christians. There's Christians out there sometimes that feel like they're just hanging on by their fingernails. and They can be really uh, disturbed and shaken by some of the accusations that, that 
uh, get lobbed at Christians and the church. And so apologetics can help people become more stable in their faith to realize that some of these accusations are not as strong as they maybe think they are. And we do all this, of course, to the, the glory of God and to help our neighbor. And um, if we love our neighbor and we believe that the Christian worldview would help them, then, and we believe that our relationship with Christ would help them, <laughs> then, of course, we want to be able to make that available to them. Uh, the rest of the verse that I read about from First Peter, uh, I'll just read the rest of it. And it, the, the rest of it is important as well, so I'll read the whole piece here. So First Peter 3.15, Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. And it continues, Yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. So, we want to give an answer, but we want to do it with gentleness and respect. And another way of saying this is that we want to win the friend, not the argument. Uh, John Stackhouse is fantastic at talking about apologetics, and he's a He's a very good uh, apologetics himself. He's very, he has a book, I think it's called Humble Apologetics. And I think that that's just a fantastic way to think about doing apologetics in our world. We need to care, as God does, we need to care about the people more than the abstract truths. It's not just about winning an argument. So watch our tone. <laughs> we need to watch our tone. How we say something matters at least as much as what is said. And I think we've all had that experience where we have gotten into a discussion with somebody and they got kind of in our face and we stopped caring what, what the truth was at that point because we just felt like their disrespect for us and their unwillingness to hear our point or our side uh, just sort of it stopped mattering whether it was true or not um, so we want to watch what how we're saying what we're saying we want to watch our tone uh, we want to listen really carefully to the other person we want to hear their questions we want to hear their comments we want to ask them questions that gets to the root of their concern Sometimes they're asking a logical question, but underneath that is actually an emotional question. Um, they might be giving historical arguments against the church, against the behaviors of the church, but underneath all of that, there's an emotional concern that um, maybe they were hurt by a Christian somewhere. So sometimes the question they're asking isn't really the concern. There's something underneath it. We want to be honest about allowing them to uh, have points. Right? They might have a good point, and we want to just sort of say, that is a good point, and, and admit that, be honest about that. Uh, we also want to admit when we don't know something. We don't want to just make something up. Uh, we can make guesses, but we let them know that we're making guesses. So all of this is just to say that we want to be honest and have integrity in the midst of that conversation. And the relationship matters more than the, the answers, actually. Um, just a couple of verses to back this up. So Ephesians 4, 29 to 32 says this, Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up, as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. And 2 Timothy 2, verses 24-26. And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach, 
patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness, God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth, and they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. So all this to say is how we say what we say, the kindness and gentleness that we use and exhibit matters, not just the argument itself. Um, and maybe that doesn't have to be said to anyone who's listening to this, but it's worth saying because there, there are some belligerent uh, Christians who try to kind of bully people. And I think that that's something that just doesn't make sense according to what we're looking at here. <laughs> so, so what we're trying to do is we're not, we're not trying to argue someone into the kingdom. That's just not, I don't even think that's possible. <laughs> um, it's the Holy Spirit's job to get someone into the kingdom. It's holiness that converts people. It's not arguments. But what, what we can do through apologetics is we can remove obstacles and level the ground. Uh, apologetics is trying to show Christianity as a worldview is rational, that it makes sense of our lives and makes sense of the world. So these arguments don't necessarily convert anyone. It's the Holy Spirit's job to do that. Uh, people might have resistance, they might have blockages, and apologetics can help, help with that. Apologetics can say, oh, you have this one issue with this. Let's see if we can deal with that concern. And once that boulder is moved out of the way, then maybe their resistance to what God might be trying to do in their life uh, is, is easier for them. So that's what we're trying to do. Uh, we're trying to help people to, at the very least, walk away from the conversation with more respect for Christians, for Christianity, than they were before the conversation. We're trying to show them that we're not crazy for believing this stuff, that there is a, a rational reason for why we believe what we believe. We're not crazy, we're not moronic for holding to a Christian worldview. And the way that I sometimes think about it is that it's theology for those who aren't kind of on the inside of Christianity. So we have systematic theology, which is what, how all the pieces of Christian belief fit together. And apologetics I sometimes think of as how Christianity makes sense for those coming from outside of the Christian, uh, the, the Christian worldview. So we need to know who we're talking to, and John Stackhouse is really good about helping us understand how to, how to get there. So who are we talking to? Uh, what are their questions? What are their concerns? What are their needs? We're living in a pluralistic culture, and so we can't really make any assumptions about where people are coming from. And we need to listen very carefully to their replies. Uh, we need to listen not only for the content of what they're saying, but we also need to listen for their attitude. We need to listen for their emotion. We need to find out what they find out. What they find is authoritative. Um, so do they find logic authoritative? Where you say, well, A leads to B equals C. Uh, or are they more, uh, do, do they see experience as being more authoritative? So when someone tells their story and they trust that person, is that more authoritative for that person? Uh, or maybe they have a strong sense of morality and justice. And so that is, is kind of what they feel to be authoritative, is the moral, the moral piece of their experience. So and there's a number of different ways that people will have, will hold authority or will they will find certain things authoritative. Um, sometimes it's logic, sometimes it's experience, sometimes it's, it's these other things. But it's important to figure that out with the person you're, you're talking to. And how open are they? Are they friendly to Christianity? They make, maybe they have never really encountered a Christian, and so they're actually pretty curious about Christianity. 
in our pluralistic worldview, uh, sorry, pluralistic society where we have lots of people coming from dis different parts of the world, we're encountering more and more people who haven't really had encounters with Christians. So there are some people who are genuinely curious about Christianity. Um, we might also encounter people who are uh, consider themselves an enemy of Christianity, that Christians are the cause of the Crusades, or uh, Christians have done horrible things in the past, and so they, they see themselves as, as enemies of, of Christianity. Maybe they're people who've been hurt by the church, and so we, we need to take that into account as we, we try to have conversations with them. Uh, maybe they're super committed to another worldview. They're maybe they're from another religion, or maybe they're uh, naturalistic, uh, materialistic scientists. Um, they're more into scientism. Scientism being kind of a worldview where science can explain everything, and everything will eventually be call fall under the umbrella of science. So maybe they come from a worldview. If I figure that out, where are they coming from? And, how you have to take that into account when you're when you're talking to them about Christianity. Um, maybe they don't want to be disturbed in their worldview. Maybe they're very happy with their worldview. But maybe maybe this they're someone who is feeling some sort of existential anxiety and they're questioning a lot of things right now. So where are they in all of that? It's important that we take the person seriously. Uh, so. Peter, he preached to, to the Jews in Acts chapter 2, and Paul preached to the Greeks, the Gentiles, in Acts chapter 17. And we need to, those two different contexts mattered. So in 1 Corinthians 9, verses 20 to 23, we read this. This is Paul talking. To the Jews, I became as a Jew in order to win Jews. To those under the law, I became as one under the law, though not being myself under the law, that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law, I became as one outside the law, not being outside the law of God, but under the law of Christ, that I might win those outside the law. To the weak, I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people, that by all means I might save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel, that I may share with them its, in its blessings." So he's saying that he takes who they are into account in the way that he talks to them. And we see this when Peter preaches to the Jews in Acts chapter 2. He's talking about scripture, he's talking about prophecy, he's talking about the Messiah. So he's talking very much using the authority that would be accepted by the Jewish people. And when we look at Paul preaching to the Greeks, the Gentiles, in Acts 17, he's quoting their poets, he's pointing to their statues, a statue of the unknown God. Uh, he references, he uses references from their world, and he argues, he's probably using rhetoric that matches the way that their own people would, would argue. And so we likewise need to be able to draw on the world of the person that we're having a conversation with. If they are interested in a certain type of music, it might be important that we understand that music so that we can see where it connects with the gospel. Um, if they're a new agey kind of person, it might be important that we take that into account as we have a conversation with them. If they are a materialistic atheist, then we need to take that into account as well. So uh, where they're coming from matters. So you don't want a, a canned presentation that you can then bowl them over with to we want to make a genuine interaction. Um, you can have prepared arguments, you can have prepared ideas, you know, the common, that's what we're talking about kind of today is there's kind of these common things that we just deal with, uh, common reasons for believing in God or common arguments against God. It's good to have some of those things in your back pocket that you can pull them out, um, but we don't want to just start into a canned presentation. Um, that's not going to be very helpful and you know we can trust the Holy Spirit to, to bring things to mind as well and, uh, to be active in the midst of that conversation as we as we pray apologetics can be used in at least three ways so we can use it 
in a protective way. So we, we can say, you know, Christianity deserves to be at the table with other worldviews. Right? It's not particularly dangerous, it's not particularly irrational, so it deserves a place at the table among other worldviews. That's kind of the protective view. It's just sort of saying, hey, we're, we're rational. There's, we have good reason for thinking the way that we do. Um, is it, so basically, Christians are not crazy for believing in X, and here's why. That's what apologetics can do. It deserves to stand among other options. You move up another layer from that, and you can have kind of a comparatively better is the, the stance of that, the next level of apologetics. So what you're doing is you're trying to say, it's not only at the table with the other options, here's why it's actually better than the other options. So it starts to come out from just being, uh, allow us to be one among many. The other is saying, here's why this is actually a better worldview. And then the, um, there's a, another level where there's kind of an imperative claim, which says only the Christian worldview is rational and all the rest are ridiculous and not rational and not worth believing in. And I don't think that that's a place that we want to go in. Um, it's just, uh, it doesn't seem to be a place that we can stand with intellectual integrity. We want to honestly recognize that you know, uh, Buddhists can have good reasons for being Buddhists and people who believe in, in naturalism have a good reason for believing in naturalism. So, uh, but we at least want to say that we deserve to have a place at the table and that's even if our apologetics just gets us there then that's a good thing especially in our world there are different kinds of evidence that can be brought forward when we're doing apologetics so there is subjective evidence and this is more intuitive it's our own experiences so subjective is like to the person, it's a, a personal, individual experience or belief or intuition. Objective is kind of the, usually considered the opposite of subjective. So objective is like, it's a shared thing that it, within our um, society it exists outside of people in a way. And subjective is more personal. So it might be an intuition that I have. It, it's something that I have direct access to. Um, I might just, not for any good reason, but I just feel like history is not an illusion. Like I wasn't created five minutes ago with the illusion of time. I just, I wasn't, I'm not in the matrix right now. <laughs> um, I'm not dreaming right now. I, I'm awake and I, I, I it's not, I, I have a sense, not, I don't have a good reason, but I have a sense that I'm not in the matrix. I might have a strong moral sense of right and wrong. So I just know what is fair, what is just. And my I don't get there from reason. I get there just from a, a strong sense within myself about what is right and what is wrong. And then I can, I can maybe later come up with arguments around it, but it, I start with what's in, internal to me is this justice that I feel. So I can have this kind of subjective evidence uh, that I can bring forward. I might say to someone, don't, you know, don't you feel this moral case? Don't you feel that it would just be just if X, Y, Z? And they might agree with that, even though there might not be, we might, we not, might not have gotten there through logic. So there's these kinds of subjective evidence that, that we can bring forward. The weakness, well, maybe I'll say the strength of it first. So the, the strength of this kind of subjective evidence is uh, that it can be pretty valuable in, in the sense that it's not reductionistic. It, it's not, uh, it builds up. So I have a strong sense of morality. I have a strong sense of that um, there's a purpose to my life, that I'm not just, you know, a meat machine trying to reproduce itself, um, 
that history is not an illusion, um, that I was, you know, th these kinds of experiential things just build up inside of me. So the weakness of it is that people can have contrary experiences. So uh, if my subjective experience is in contradiction to that other person's subjective experience, then there's no way of kind of winning that. <laughs> you just kind of have to hold them both out, out in, the, in the discussion. Okay, so looking at another kind of, of uh, evidence is that you can have like logic and reason, so or evidence and reason. So we can give a premise, make an inference, and then have a conclusion. So it's very A leads to B equals C. This is what we do when we're doing science often. We talk about this is our best hypothesis so far. We say things like, it seems to make the most sense of the evidence. So here's all the evidence, and which explanation makes the most sense of that evidence. Um, Thomas Aquinas is very much like this. He, he gives his five proofs for, for God's existence. And there has to be some shared beliefs for this to work. We have to agree on the evidence that then leads to this next piece. So if we don't have a shared belief around the evidence, then it's not going to be as powerful. Um, and uh, for that reason, it, this tends not to be as powerful with people who are steeped in postmodernism, because postmodernism has a kind of a relativistic view of, of truth. Truth is just more complicated than it is for people who are kind of in a modernist mindset. So um, if you are talking to people who are already interested in logical arguments and who aren't steeped in postmodernism, so you might have somebody who is interested in, in who has maybe a naturalistic worldview, um, who is interested in science and math, and uh, then this might be the kind of argument that you might want to bring up. This might not work with someone who is, uh, say, a Hindu who believes that life is has a, a strong illusion piece to it, um, or maybe even a, an atheist who says that in contradiction to a miracle, I would rather believe a really crazy, um, a really crazy set of events that took place that are just astronomically unlikely to happen, rather than believe in the miracle, because the miracle is just so not worth believing in. So rather than having a supernatural argument or a supernatural piece of my worldview, I would rather have the unlikeliness of uh, the unlikeliness, but maintain this unlikely explanation within my worldview. So I hope that makes sense. I, I know I'm not, maybe I'm not being super clear. <laughs> um, but you can have a mixture of these things. And John Stackhouse talks about the appeal to the Christian worldview. So my, what you might want to do is have a combination of one, like the experience, the subjective evidence, and two, the reason, the logic. Uh, so the person you're having a conversation with, you, you say, okay, let's line up all these worldviews along with the Christian worldview, along with your worldview, and let's see how they compare on the whole. Do they make sense? Which one makes the most sense of the evidence that's in front of us? Which one makes the most sense of that sense of justice that you feel? Which one makes sense in terms of the, the logical conclusions that we can make? Um, you kind of want to draw a map of, of reality. So we, if we draw this map of, of reality, which worldview seems to account for the most evidence, both experiential and logical? How does it help us make sense of life? How does it help us live life? How well does it fit the range of evidence? So which worldview seems to, to work best for all that? 
Now, they might not agree that the Christian worldview is the, the best way to go, but um, that is, that's probably a pretty good, good way to have a discussion uh, if people want to go there with you. It's worth saying something about postmodernism because we, we are pretty steeped in it at the moment. Um, for people who are postmodern, it's important to use art, pictures, images, stories, movies, music. That can be much more powerful than logical arguments. The, sometimes it's said, um, it's not so much that it's true, but does it work? Does it change your life? Does it change the way you live in, in a good sense? So what will help this person take one more step close to God. It's not about manipulating people, but it's about opening up doors to have conversations with people. So for example, and I think it's uh, Alistair McGrath who, who talks about this. He's very good at talking about postmodernism and uh, apologetics. So the Da Vinci Code, as a, a book that came out, I can't remember, the 2000s, I guess, maybe? It was a while ago now. But everyone was kind of caught up by this book. I remember being in the church when this came out. And so there was people who were genuinely shaken in their faith. And there were people who you'd meet on the street who were like, they, they just believe that that's really what's going on. <laughs> that, uh, you know, the, the church had some big conspiracy and they uh, were hiding the bloodline of Jesus and all this kind of stuff. And like, this is a, this is a fiction book. Like you go to the fiction section to buy this book, but people were believing this. So there was something really powerful about the story that caught people, even though you look on the back of the book and it's, it says fiction, <laughs> right? And then you look at the way that Christians responded to it. And uh, apologists, they, they kind of made a systematic and uh, prose logical arguments. It was kind of boring compared to the excitement of this novel that was written. So the, and the responses didn't just, it didn't catch people. It didn't catch people's emotions. It didn't make them excited. It just didn't catch people the way that the story did. So this is, this is the, the, the environment we're in right now, that some, sometimes the story matters more than a logical argument. We may also want to show how Christianity is beautiful and desirable before even worrying about whether it's true. And there are some really beautiful and desirable parts of the Christian worldview. Um, the Christian worldview, we might say to, to our conversation partner, gives us a reason to care for the vulnerable. You know, Jesus says in Matthew 25 that we will see him in the vulnerable. Those who are in need. He is in what uh, Mother Teresa called his distressing disguise when he's with, when he's disguised as the poor. So the Christian worldview gives a reason for us to care for the vulnerable. Caring for them genuinely matters. The Christian worldview tells us that the underdog can win. And we might want to talk about David and Goliath, this little shepherd boy versus this giant soldier who is uh, covered in armor. This little shepherd boy with his sling was able to defeat him. So do we want to believe in a worldview where the, the underdog can win? The Christian worldview gives us a reason for pain, or at least infuses suffering and pain with meaning. And we might look at the cross and we see how Jesus infused that suffering with meaning and used it and transformed it to bring about forgiveness and healing to show God's love and how that pain and suffering um, can, can give our pain and suffering meaning as well. 
we might look at the resurrection within the Christian worldview and show how that shows that we can have hope no matter what. Jesus died on the cross and was buried and left for dead. His own disciples were anointing him and doing the burial rituals for him and had given up any hope that, um, that the story was going to continue for him. And But he, against all expectations, he came back to life. And so we have this story of the resurrection that shows us that we can have hope no matter what we are facing. We can also look at someone like Stalin, who killed many, many, many people. And on his deathbed, uh, shook his hand toward God and never really had to feel any of the... He didn't, never had to face justice for what he had done to those people. In the Christian worldview, he will have to face God and will have to face justice. He'll have to answer for what he's done. So those are pretty desirable, pretty beautiful reasons that we have in the Christian worldview. Then we could stack up other worldviews and say, okay, how do you deal with this? How do you think the vulnerable should be cared for? Why is it important that they're cared for within that worldview? Um, do you have something that explains or gives hope that the underdog can win? Um, do you have meaning infused into suffering? Do you have a reason for hope? Do you have a way that the, the powerful and corrupt are held to account for the, the bad things that they've done, if they've done bad things? So is justice real? Uh, or do they, do they get away with it if they, if they die before they face, uh, face the court? <laughs> So these are some things we might want to consider as we have conversation with someone who is uh, considering the Christian worldview or open to asking questions about it.